and start letting people in. Barry, and we do a streaming on YouTube and it has gained more and more attendees. So there'll be folks here and there. Great. I just shared out the YouTube link to a bunch of people, so. Porter says, hi, Varian. He couldn't be here. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Happy Thursday. Happy October 7th. We'll start in one minute. So happy you're here with us today. Please feel free to open your chat, say hi. Hi, Kara. Hello, everybody. Patrick, I think we can go ahead and play the open. Hey, good morning, everybody. So happy to have you in the house today. Welcome to folks in the Zoom room and also to folks watching uh, live stream on YouTube. This is Human Touch. I'm Lou Solomon with Interact Studio, and we have a wonderful guest this morning. Varian Schrum is the community manager for Camp North End. One of the cool things we get to do with this program is talk to people that we really admire uh, doing work that matters and makes Charlotte a better place. And she sure fits into that category. Thanks for coming, Varian. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Now, just a smidge of background, because we're going to play a video for you. We think that it says a thousand words, certainly more than I could ever do it justice. We'll hear much more from Varian on this. But Camp North End is a huge development that is north of uptown on Statesville Avenue, 76 acres with a rich history, an amazing spread of old factory buildings that has become just has combusted really in the last little bit into restaurants and shops and musical space. Let's look at it here. You can see the expanse of it. Varian, what are we seeing here? This is just um, a little snapshot of different places on site, which you mentioned is 76 acres, so large that we divided it into a few districts where a lot of the development and activity is clustered. Uh, but really Camp North End is a place to 
spend free time to work in beautiful office space, to grab a drink or a meal, uh, to appreciate art, um, you name it. There's, it's the equivalent of 14 square blocks of uptown. So whatever you would expect to see in 14 square blocks of a city's, you know, center, um, we've tried to seed that kind of activity here. So you can see uh, little snippets of all of that, people hanging out, kids and families uh, expressing their creativity, professional working artists, um, all of the above. It's, it's really a multifaceted um, space. Yeah. Well, and right before we started, we were talking about Van Gogh and how uh, it was, well, and is, I mean, it's, it's ongoing, but tell us about the numbers uh, and, and the new folks that came in waves to Camp North End because of immersive Van Gogh. Yeah, I mean, prior to Van Gogh, um, Camp North End, a lot of the, the daily activity or the activity that was at Camp North End previously was more um, one-off event driven. Like when we first got started, there was not a reason to come out. We had to manufacture reasons and activities for people to enjoy. So um, if we weren't planning an event, there wasn't anyone there. <laughs> Over time, you know, we've um, generated a lot of that traffic of course, with daily events, but also bringing in businesses who have regular operating hours. Uh, but Van Gogh really was just gas on the fire. Um, they, on a busy weekday, 2,000 people might come out. On a busy weekend, 3,000 people might come out. And that's just for Van Gogh on top of everything else we're doing. So that really um, was a game changer for us this year. Yeah. Well, there had to be a time where you were looking at Camp North End for the first time, and it, it certainly didn't look anything like it does today. <laughs> so what struck you, what struck you about that space and what did you think it could be? Uh, so actually the first time I saw it was December, 2016. And um, Damon, the owner and developer of Camp North End had reached out to me on LinkedIn <laughs> and said, do you wanna come see this space? I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take a look. Um, I was working in Uptown at the time. And so I had no idea where this place was. So I allowed 30 minutes to get there. <laughs> and I arrived in three minutes, <laughs> made every light and then was 27 minutes early for my meeting. But um, so my first thought was, wow, this is really close to Uptown and it's huge. And so much like expansive historic architecture that, you know, in my bubble living in Charlotte, it was, there was a lot of griping about everything old is torn down. There's no old buildings. And I was like, my first thought was, wow, this is 76 acres of actually meaningful historic, historic buildings right next to uptown. So that was my first thought. And then as Damon and I were walking around the site and he was describing, you know, the vision for a big mixed use adaptive reuse um, project, my, my next thought was, wow, this is a very big opportunity for Charlotte. And I hope the developer gets it right. And the fact that I had a chance to be part of helping get it right, I, I felt like almost a responsibility to the city to be part of it and um, help, help it land in a way that Charlotte would be excited about, would embrace. Um, yeah, overall, just like the sense of possibility was um, evident. So, um, yeah, I, I had a million ideas as we were walking around and it was a pretty dreary December day, but, um, if you have an imagination and a love for public space, I think you can see what's possible. So, um, yeah, those were some of my first impressions. Yeah. And one thing we are so excited about is the fact that you chose to lead with creatives. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's sort of a natural choice in some ways. Um, people who are more creative by nature or um, do that for a living tend to be able to see the future <laughs> a little bit better or can imagine um, alternate realities a little bit better. So. Uh, it was easier to describe a vision and have creative people understand it and want to be part of it and help bring it to life. 
Um, also at that same time, this was then January, 2017, very early that year. Um, around that time, the, I mean, I guess this is sort of a perennial conversation in Charlotte, but like, what is Charlotte's identity? You know, that was top of mind for everyone. And I guess it still is, but at the time, um, that was really on the front burner for me. And a lot of creative people were having that conversation and people were excited to be part of molding Charlotte's identity. And I, I felt like, you know what, I've seen enough that I know, I know Charlotte is creative and that all of these amazing creative types exist everywhere in the city, but maybe they're in pockets in their own, like if they're in a basement over here or, you know, a warehouse over there, there wasn't any one central place where a lot of them could come together and plant a flag in the ground and say, this is Charlotte's, this is Charlotte's creative identity. Um, so I thought there was definitely an opportunity with Camp Northern to be that kind of place. So re recruiting um, a lot of leaders in their different creative fields to be part of it from the beginning was um, definitely uh, an important way to get started. Yeah. Yeah. And even just the accompaniment of the artwork done in relationship to immersive Van Gogh and all the murals out there. I mean, it, it really, really is such a special place. The environment is so colorful and provocative. You know, what do you say would be the most important ingredients to creating a community space like the one that has emerged at Camp North End. This is your love. This is uh, something that talented people are coming to and being a part of for our cities. What, what makes it happen? You know, I think it, um, as far as ingredients go, going back to the beginning and starting with the intention of um, we, we want this to be a place where all kinds of people feel welcome and that our city is truly represented. Like I felt there weren't many places you could go and see a real cross section of the city. It was sort of, um, little bubbles and there weren't many places where you could see all different kinds of people interacting in a public space regularly. So I think if, if we have to pick an ingredient, I would say maybe, um, the intentionality around representation and it doesn't always happen automatically. So at the beginning, you need to be extra <laughs> intentional about um, curating that and seeding that. And so even in, in every small decision, like back to the beginning when we were planning Friday nights and it was like, okay, we know we want a band. We know we want a food truck. We know we want some kind of fun arts and cultural free <laughs> activity. Um, how are we making that decision? And one lens through which we made that decision was let's pick um, a band who has this following, a truck who has this following and an arts group that has this following. And those three groups maybe never interact in real, you know, in their daily lives. But if we could invite um, all three to the place at once, you know, what kind of fun interactions could happen. Um, so I, I think that was a pretty, successful way to begin and um, made for lots of interesting organic connections. And uh, yeah, I, I think you really have to be very thoughtful about that from the start and that it, it can't, if it's an afterthought, it can't work. So I think that was sort of a um, organizing principle for a lot of what we were doing and planning. And I, we, we still do our best to walk the walk in all those small decisions today and, you know, big decisions as well. But I think a lot of those small decisions add up to a big impact over time. Now you were, you were with the Knight Foundation, correct? So I participated in uh, Knight Foundation in 880 Cities had a grant program called Emerging City Champions. And I was in the first cohort in 2015. So yeah, it was sort of like a side passion project. I didn't like work for the Knight Foundation, but um, definitely became a Knight Foundation groupie <laughs> through that. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, no, uh, just tell us more about that and how that grant, uh, you know, sparked everything and, and changed the trajectory of your life. Yeah, I, you know, um, so the, the grant program, Emerging City Champions, um, was seeking 25 young people from across the U.S. in Knight Foundation cities um, with ideas to make their cities more livable. And they define livability a few ways, um, but the ways that really registered for me were um, access to public space, uh, mobility options like biking and walking infrastructure, and civic engagement. And they so they were looking for ideas that kind of um, helped foster those things in, in night cities. And my idea was pretty simple. It wasn't super innovative, but essentially to take a, an underused parking lot and turn it into a public space for a few days. We called it the neighborhood living room. Um, and it um, essentially, I was like, let's imagine this is the neighborhood. This is the neighborhood's living room. What everyone can imagine a living room in their house. That's sort of the public space of the house. Um, what kinds of things happen there where family and friends connect? Let's, let's see if we can scale that up a little bit to a neighborhood scale. Um, and that, that was my idea and it was selected. And I remember um, the first day that we were in Toronto um, for the summit with Knight Foundation and 880 Cities to workshop our ideas, meet the other fellows, meet the thought leaders. Um, I remember Gil Penalosa of 880 Cities said, um, we will know that you, you all have succeeded a year from now, not because, or we'll know you've succeeded, not because a year from now you finished a good project, but if 20 years from now you can look back and say, that was a watershed moment in my career and in my life, um, then we'll know this program was a success. And <laughs> it hasn't been 20 years, it's only been, you know, less than five or so, but uh, I can say without a doubt that was truly a watershed moment in my life. It, you know, I was just like a person in Charlotte who lived here and had some ideas. Like I uh, would walk the rail trail and see parking lots that were doing nothing right up against the light rail. Um, I personally wanted to enjoy free public space um, and then just had this idea, tried. I think really it was just a push to try. And through it, I learned that I learned so many things, but a few come to mind that everybody is waiting for someone to step up and just lead, <laughs> you know, like everyone has great ideas about um, how to, everyone has great ideas for what they want to see in their neighborhoods. And it is possible to just start trying and build um, connections and relationships that can lead to change and outcomes that you want to see. Um, and really like, yes, the event was successful. We did a pop-up for four days and had lots of programming and a thousand people came out. I mean, it, it blew my mind. I was like crying one night, like, I can't believe this is working. <laughs> but like really at the end of it, I, it was so apparent that how we did it through the process was um, just as important, if not more important than what we did. And the capacity building that came out of that, the like the relationships that were formed just by people meeting randomly or people who worked on the project and then got more invested in their neighborhood after the fact um, was all so impactful and shaped a lot, of, a lot of how I think about that kind of work. And also I think it um, crystallized for me that it's important to be solutions oriented in this kind of work, meaning it's really easy to say, to point at a building and say less of that, boo, I don't like that. But to create um, tangible experiences and examples that people can say, yes, more of this, more of this, um, that got me really excited. Um, that whole notion of uh, showing what's possible and then giving people something positive to advocate for, <laughs> in this case, public space, really nothing novel, <laughs> but um, rather than saying, boo, less apartments, we could say, yay, more public space. Um, so uh, all of those things really shaped how I think about community engagement and um, 
this kind of work. Oh, hey, Charles. I see you <laughs> on the call. <laughs> Say night, Foundation. <laughs> Now, did uh, you know you must have heard us across the ether say Knight Foundation? <laughs> I did. My ears were like burning, and so that's that's how I knew. Yeah. But but really, what I that's... what I was getting at is that that neighborhood living room experience um, through the Knight Foundation program was almost like Camp North End 1.0, and like all the lessons learned in that experience. Um, and all the information I took in from those, those thought leaders at the summit really shaped how I think about this work. And then I was able to take all of that. And then when I saw Camp North End, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like neighborhood living room times a thousand. And so all those same principles just scaled up. Uh, <clears throat> yes. And, and Charles, isn't that what you hope for when a grant, um, you know, in terms of her experience winds up manifesting that way. Yeah, that's what's so cool about the Emerging Cities Champion is, you know, you have someone like Varian that can take $5,000, turn it into a prototype, but then um, a leader like Varian gets the publicity so that she can go on to a project like Camp North End. And I'm, it's just awesome and amazing. And yes, that is what we are seeking with when we make grants and we make investments is that um, that impact will grow and scale and Varian is a prime example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Varian did Camp North End develop into what was your original vision or how has it surprised you? Maybe that's the, the question. What's, what's surprising you now? What's surprising me now? Um, you know, I think one thing I was surprised by early on was how quickly people got it and embraced it. I really thought I was going to have to spend the first couple of years trying to convince people to come see it. <laughs> and pretty quickly, it was like people came out to see it and then they wanted to be a part of it. So um, I would say my role shifted more quickly than I thought from trying to be a cheerleader, get it going to stewarding a community. Um, so I think I'm, I don't know if I'm surprised, but I'm, it's amazing to see how that vision has come to fruition with real people running real businesses or, um, nonprofit organizations and like all those sort of aspirational, uh, hopes and dreams we had at the beginning, like people will collaborate from all different industries, like seeing that actually happen in real life. I think it doesn't get old, you know, um, seeing Ally Bank's innovation department out there next door to junior achievement and black market and like seeing the way that they all collaborate in ways you could not have anticipated. I think I'm always impressed and surprised in a good way by um, how those relationships really do develop organically. And then the creative ideas and projects that come out of it. Yeah. What are the challenges going ahead, Barry? And what, what are you looking at? You know, there's this thing, COVID, <laughs> um, that's, that remains a challenge for sure. Um, it was really challenging last year, especially when, I mean, my whole job is let's convene people in a, in a physical place. Uh, that was hard to do when that was against the law. So um, thankfully we can, we can gather more safely now and Camp North End has plenty of outdoor space that makes that easier. Um, but of course that, that does remain a challenge because a lot of Camp North End's ultimate business model is office rent. People are working from home and um, offices keep delaying the return to the office. You know, <laughs> it seems every three months they announce three more months, three more months, which I, you know, I understand. And, um, we're, we respect that, but that is a challenge too, that, um, part of the vision is having large office tenants alongside small businesses and arts collectives and nonprofits. And, you know, that is an important piece of the equation that so far, um, we, 
we have pieces of it, but we're still waiting for that like first big office tenant and COVID is sort of the, overcoming COVID is a big, um, is that first domino perhaps to. Yes. Yes. Well, Susie, do you have a question for Varian? I, I would love to hear just a little bit more about some of the organic um, collaboration that happens. Give us a couple of examples of what does that look like and, and how is Camp North in a model for that? You know, um, I think some of my favorite examples are Wendy O'Connor Art and Home next door to um, Black Market, which I alluded to before, both arts collectives or Wendy O'Connor is an artist from South Charlotte. She does fine oil paintings that she turns into um, wallpaper and um, textiles for furniture that she shows at High Point Market, you know. And then Black Market is a very grassroots um, art collective meant to lift up Black creatives. And it couldn't be more different, I guess, and the kinds of subcultures they appeal to, but they have become best friends and uh, give each other or like create opportunities for each other. Wendy has shown at some of um, Black Market's shows that they've uh, curated at like the Mint Museum. Wendy's introduced some of those artists to her high-end clientele who have hired them to paint a bathroom in their house. You know, just like that kind of social capital, I, I think is just so rewarding and exciting. And that's just a small example, but um, I know, uh, oh, TM Studio, which is Ally Banks Innovation Department. Um, they have worked with Junior Achievement to uh, try to bring um, a new Minecraft game that, that their uh, HBCU interns, they had a program for, uh, developed a couple of years ago. And then now it's this whole it has one and a half million downloads on Minecraft <laughs> um, to teach digital literacy. And, they, and they're working with Junior Achievement to roll that out to middle school students. Um, Hex Coffee is currently doing a collaboration with Leah and Louise. Um, their pastry chef is, um, her name is Jasmine. She's kind of uh, starting to go out on her own a little bit and spread her wings and donuts are kind of her thing. And so they're working together to do a coffee and donut pop up together on Saturday mornings. Um, and, and there's a million more examples, but those are the few that are top of mind because they're happening right now. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that is uh, getting at the essence and the magic of Camp North End. One final question I would ask Varian is if you remove everything from Camp North End, you know, what is the essence when you think of that space and what is there organically and has been there? What, what is Camp North End? I think if you take away all the buildings and space, it really, Camp North End is really an idea. The idea that being in community with people who aren't exactly like you makes us all better, makes you better, makes us all better. Um, that's kind of the foundational principle, I guess, in everything we're doing, um, that it makes you more empathetic, more creative, more connected, more productive in your work. Um, and I think that plays out in lots of different ways, but if you really take away the buildings and you're, you're just left with the people, um, I mean, really the, the buildings are only as good as the people who fill them. Without people, it's just bricks. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it really does come down to the, the essence of a diverse community um, is that it's better for all of us if we're uh, regularly interacting with people who aren't exactly like us and challenging our worldviews and um, giving us different perspectives on things. Yeah. 
What, what a great note to begin closing out with. We're just so fortunate to have uh, brilliant minds like yours helping lead the way with creative public space. There are so many ways that that space will impact the good of Charlotte. And it, and it is just three minutes uh, from uptown. People tend to think of that being way north of, well, no, it's not. It's, it's a very short, it's just uh, adjusting your mindset to understanding that it is so close to us. It's a part of our history. And now there's something really magical happening at Camp North End. So thank you so much, Varian. Just a, a quick heads up that we next time will have uh, as our guest, April Whitlock, who is with uh, Lending Tree and is going to talk to us about the future of corporate giving and their Lend a Hand program. A shout out to the Interact family in the house. We have Patrick Sheehan, Susie Adams, Michael Samet. Jess Barilla, and one more time, help me thank Varian Shrum with a big old applause <laughs> and a heart. Yep. <laughs> thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Yeah. I'm so glad Susie asked about those organic relationships because gosh, do you get a sense of like the black market and the, um, the artist.